Well, hello and welcome to The Sacred Speaks. My name is John Price. I'm your host. Thanks for being here today. If you're listening to this on any of the podcast affiliates, wonderful. Thank you for your support. Please be sure to like and share any episodes that you do like. But also know that The Sacred Speaks is now available on YouTube. Go to YouTube, search The Sacred Speaks, and while you're there, be sure to subscribe to the page and like any episode that you do. It really helps as this project is growing and building. So while on the subject of The Sacred Speaks, check it out at thesacredspeaks.com, and links are below. Uh, Follow them at your leisure. And what you will learn is that I've been working really hard for a while on this project of exploring depth psychology, religion, philosophy, uh, and all other various areas of the sacred and the profane. And it's been really exciting, and as some folks have voiced recently through emails y'all are sending, uh, this thread of the podcast, which I'm still on and unraveling, is exciting. Uh, this is another one of the, 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 the podcasts and the connections that I've had based upon conversations that I initially had with Brian Marescu, uh, who is the author of The Immortality Key, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but Tom Hatzis, Thomas Hatzis, is a name that stuck out, and certainly the title of his book, um, The Witch's Ointment, stuck out. Because this is right in line with one of my curiosities as I was reading The Immortality Key. I'm sure I'm not alone in that curiosity. Witches and women and persecution and the way gender role shows up and how power affects culture and what we're really losing as a culture because we're still living out some of the the issues associated with the power dynamics has certainly put uh, all male institutions in the central role of society and pushed uh, the feminine out into other other spaces. So the witch is a horribly misunderstood uh, idea, you know, um, and uh, Tom does a great job of writing about it. Uh, he's got a website. Check him out at the Psych- Psychedelic Historian. And I want to make sure, yes, uh, Thomas Hatzis, check him out at psychedelichistorian.com, P-S-Y-C-H-E-D-E-L-I-C-H, I-S-T-O-R-I-A-N, looking over at my computer. Uh, a lot of cool things over here on his website. So he also has a really cool yeah. database he's working on with a colleague. Um, he, he wants to be the uh, create the space where people can go and have all their questions answered and certainly have resources. So um, th- we've got a couple of those that are growing and building in the podcast. Again, click the link below. Uh, there, there, uh, I'll, I'll direct you to any of his information. Check out his website. Tom, thanks for this. I'm excited for our second conversation uh, on your second book, is the Psychedelic Mystery Traditions, a comprehensive look at the long tradition of psychedelic magic and religion in Western civilization. So we kind of made a plan to regroup in about three months and connect on that book, so I'm excited to do that. Tom, thank you, uh, and thanks for this book. Order it, right? Check it out. It's a very cool read, and it's a good complement to, uh, to what I was exploring when I was reading Brian's book. Uh, Speaking of Brian, as you all know that have been listening to the podcast or watching it, I'm teaching a class right now. We are loosely basing the class on the immortality key. The class is called How to Die Before You Die, and we just finished class one. It was a fantastic group. I'm blown away by how many incredible folks with rich history um, in these subjects are present in this class. You can still come. Uh, There are three classes left. It's Tuesdays, so it will... It's great. My calendar's on my phone. Um, It'll start next Tuesday, which will be the... What does that make it? The 4th. The 4th of May is our second class. The the class after that, Brian Marescu will be joining us to talk about the book. And the 4th class, we're probably going to do some integration work and talking about where we've been. So please come and join us. It's at the Young Center. Look that up at younghouston.org. Again, below, there's a link directly to the class. It's a virtual class, so anybody can join. Uh, please come on in. It's open to you, and it's, uh, it's been fun. It's, it's really exciting. Thank you for those of you who are in the class. This is a, a, an incredible group, and I'm excited to, to mine this territory with you all. Uh, uh, music. So music on the podcast is from Modern Nations. Check them out at modernnationsmusic.com. Uh, the podcast is sponsored by the Center for the Healing Arts and Sciences. Check us out at the Center for F O R H A S dot com, the Center for Haas dot com. And there you'll find all kinds of cool wellness resources and links. We've also got a panel discussion that we've been doing through the pandemic, really through the past year, where all the clinicians and practitioners come together and talk about meaningful subjects. 
and we hear from different traditions and different perspectives. So go to YouTube, type in Get Centered, or the Center for the Healing Arts and Sciences, and you will find our panel discussion. As you may know, I've got some cool things cooking with the Sacred Speaks. There's going to be a YouTube series that begins in a couple of months. We're still working on the last parts of that, and I am eager to start synthesizing a lot of this material and, um, and integrating it. So that again, that'll be about two months. And in this interview, Tom, Tom comes at this material from a historian's perspective. And I found that to be really helpful because uh, these different traditions and different disciplines all have different practices scientifically in order to engage complex material. And I found myself learning a whole lot from Tom. So, Tom, thanks for that education. What is also interesting is the amount of differences that are, uh, that, that are represented in the folks that I'm interviewing. And so it, it really does um, beg the question or set us up as participants and curious individuals doing research for our own purposes. Because as you may have heard me say before, which a mentor and friend told me about this once, that all research is really me-search. And so we need to have certain ways of guarding against our tendencies to project our own ideas of the world and history and ourself and our life experience onto material that has not been influenced by our life experience in large part. So these traditions, whether it be psychology or the classics or history, have ways of interrogating information. And Tom taught me a lot about the historian's approach. And with that said, you'll hear differences in what Brian's talking about, or Tom's talking about, or Mark Airy, who's the participant that I'm going to post next week. There are a lot of different perspectives. So I, I, I urge all of us to know that the burden is on us. We can certainly trust uh, whatever resources that we come to trust, which is important, right, because we can't do all the heavy lifting. I mean, after all, we're all not going to go down to the Vatican and look at the secret archives. That's reserved for a couple of folks. So there's an element of trust when we do that. But when, it, when we are exploring all these different subject matters, it is very important for us to question and to say, is that true? And to wonder if we've heard something from one person and we hear, hear another thing from somebody else, uh, it doesn't mean anybody's wrong. It means now you have the opportunity to investigate that and come to your own clear understanding. And that's really what, we, what I did when I was writing my dissertation. The first thing we do is look for gaps in the research. Where are there conflicts? Where are there uh, open spaces? Um, and how can I contribute to this space? And again, if it's me search, then we're all on that quest. And quite frankly, I think one of the reasons why things are so chaotic right now, and I'm not to be totally reductive, but things are very chaotic right now because of the fact that we are inundated with so much information that it's very difficult to get our balance. And so we end up trusting sources or trusting headlines or not doing the work of critical thinking. I didn't take my first critical thinking class until my second bachelor's degree. I think that's horrid. That should have been an entire semester, like a prerequisite before college, in high school, in middle school. But critical thinking is not exactly something that we're taught to do. We are taught to be reactive. We are taught to have bias. We are taught to not interrogate our own tendencies for bias and judgment. So with that soapbox, uh, I want to leave it there. Thanks for being here. Uh, check out The Sacred Speaks. Check out The Psychedelic Historian. Uh, check out the class at the Young Center. Uh, look at all the other classes at the Young Center right now. It's an amazing space that through the pandemic has opened its uh, walls, has expanded its walls from being a brick-and-mortar place to now the Young Center is offering a lot of classes in the virtual space. So check that out, youngyouston.org. And thanks for being here, and for now we'll leave it there. Now, now we're live, live and on. No. <laughs> oh no! Oh shit! Oh no! Um, hat sis. No, turn it back now. That's how you say it. Hat sis, right? Yeah, like a hat on your head. You call your sister sis. Hat sis. Good. Uh, yeah. Okay. It was originally Hesse Pavelis, but the guy at Ellis Island didn't feel like writing that twice. So he said to my grandfather, you're going to be Hatsis, and said to his brother, you're going to be Pavlis. So all my cousins are Pavlis, and we're all Hatsis. Hatsis isn't even a last name. It's actually a title. It means someone in my family went and visited Mecca, made a pilgrimage to Mecca, and perhaps converted to Islam, and that's actually what Hatsi means. So Hatsi Pavlis means the, Pavlis, the person of the Pavlis family who made a pilgrimage to Mecca.
Oh, hell yes. That's what were they doing? Why do they have to mess that stuff up? You know, you're this and you're that. That's a beautiful story. I know. (laughs) Puritanical, restrictive and repressive. That's not true. Not everybody, but you know, I no, of course not. I'm, I'm, I'm being cheeky, cheeky bastard. (laughs) Um, so I, I see Tom here on your, uh, I'm going to look around for a second on your website, which is psychedelichistorian.com, and I'll have plenty of links to this. You've got a ton of great stuff on here. However, <laughs> your bio is the uh, most concise bio that I've seen in a while. I really appreciate it. I'm going to read it really quickly just so people get it. So Thomas Hatsis is an author, lecturer, and historian of witchcraft, magic, Western religions, contemporary psychedelia, entheogens, and medieval pharmacopoeia. And that's a that's that's a perfect synopsis of uh, of what you do. So, Seems a little long to me, actually. I need to do something with my bio then because it's uh, it's a little too long. I yeah. I'm 2000... actually trying to get away from bios, is but like I long that. bios. I feel like uh, yeah, people are sometimes, especially in like psychedelic uh, circles you'll have somebody talking about ego loss and then give you a bio that's like five minutes long. And it's like, oh, <laughs> ego loss, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm scared of that, man. I don't know. Really? <laughs> ego <laughs> ego loss gets a lot of confusing associations. I, I don't know that a lot of people know what that means when they say that. Sure. Well, with ego loss, I mean, there. so there comes a point, like if you, especially with something like 5-MeO-DMT, I don't know if you've ever tried 5-MeO-DMT. Mm-hmm. Or like high doses of mushrooms or anything like that. Um, well, there will come a point where you kind of your your ego more or less merges with all that is. Yeah. So there isn't isn't too much of a separation there. People call it like a non dual state. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least my friend Martin calls it that. And um, so one of the things though is that people like, and that's totally an achievable thing. But people come back from that experience and feel like they've permanently annihilated their ego. And it's like, well, no, you haven't. And that's okay, because if you didn't have an ego, you'd be as interesting to talk to as a rock. So, (laughs) Right. Yeah. So having an ego, it's not terrible, but you don't want to overdo it either, you know? Yeah. Well, and so, well, good. Well, that actually opens up something that, um, that I want to spend time getting into. But before we get going down that rabbit hole, I stum- as I was saying before, I stumbled into your work by way of Brian Marescu, who who has written this really powerful book, The Immortality Key. And when he quoted you at one point, I I feel like my book list was just getting larger and larger. So I ordered your book, and your book I want to show is The Witch's Ointment. And it's the secret history of psychedelic magic. And oddly enough, Tom, I, that's exactly where I am right now. I'm really looking at magic and witches and alternate states of consciousness and certainly religion and religious history. So I've been very excited to talk to you because how you come at this is, is fascinating. And in fact, you were referencing folks that I've been learning about recently that I mean, I'm excited to get your reference page and, and especially the stuff that's written in the 13th, 14th, 15th century so I, I want to get into that, and maybe that's uh, where we start. But actually, I mean, my first question has to do with, would you give an overview of the history of witches? Can you just set us up that way? Sure. Sure. Uh, beginning from like the, the ancient, ancient world, or like medieval times, early modern period. Like, I think as early you, as, as, like, early as you... Lot? Yeah, as early as you can okay. go. Okay. Uh, well, in my belief is that some of the earliest witches that we read about uh, in sources like Hikate, Medea, Circe, I think that they were all more or less based off of actual people or at least actual practices that existed at some point deep, deep, deep in the ancient world. Now, one of the things that we sometimes today we conflate um, magic in the ancient world with polytheism in the ancient world. Um, There's this idea that 
magic and witchcraft was tolerated under, let's say, pagan Rome. And it was only later when Christians took over that they came down on magicians, witches, people of that sort. That's actually not true historically. The ancient Roman Empire was very harsh against witches and magicians. Um, and some people were actually um, harsh within that profession. Like there's one case, oh, I forget what um, what source this is from, uh, so shit. But there was a, uh, a, a woman who was a, um, a witch and uh, her competitor had been arrested for practicing witchcraft. And she asked if she could have the honor of being the one to ignite her, to sort of get rid of her competitor. So you have this kind of like, it's kind of chaos in the ancient world. Um, moving through the fall of Rome and into medieval times, uh, again, we have this idea that witches were persecuted right out the gate as soon as Christians took control, but that's actually not true either. Um, witches were by and large are women that would be considered witches. I call them wise women, typically. I, mm -hmm. I, I prefer that term. But um, they were by and large left alone by church authorities up until the 13th and 14th centuries. Then they, then they, or excuse me, 14th and 15th, excuse me, 14th and 15th centuries, um, when it was determined that the only way that these women could have this kind of power was that they must be, of course, must be in league with the devil. And so that's what led to the uh, burnings of the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries. That, you know, history of witchcraft in a very small nutshell. Good. I know. I appreciate the nutshell. So, if you if we look at magic in antiquity and let's kind of set this up with a timeline in mind let's look at before common era for a moment and just explore that and say what is magic and who is a magi or a a, a wise woman you know what what did that look like so it depends a lot of the time um one of the one of the things just like today in a million years, or let's say a thousand years, it's been more realistic. We're probably not going to be here in a million years, but let's say hopefully a thousand years, we're all still here. If people talk about 2021 and, you know, in those days in that distant future time, well, people today have different ideas and thoughts and feelings about all manner of topic. So the same thing when we go back a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years, it's the same kind of situation in that it depends really where you are, what you're doing. Uh, if someone was hurt, that was the major um, criteria or criterion, I should say, for determining if something is harmful magic or uh, beneficial magic. Um, the like Roman law is, is a pretty good indication of this where they would just use the word wene, which means poison. So let's talk about my area, which is using psychoactives and magic. The word wene in Latin has three different connotations. Wene could mean poison. Well, it means poison. Uh, we get the word venom from wene, um, mm. even though it's pr pronounced like a W, it's V-E-N-E. -E. Like if you've been reading the witch's ointment, the word weneficium. Yes. Yeah. So with with that form of magic, you have three different uh, ways of understanding that word when, as I was saying, the word uh, could mean a poison, like to give somebody a deadly or, uh, you know, a drink that makes them sick, you know, something that will kill them or make them sick. That's a poison to give someone a, a medical herb that can heal them. Well, that's also a poison to give someone or or to use something that we would call entheogenic or psychedelic, well, that's also just called a poison. So you have to use the the context that the that the word is uh, you know fits into to understand if something was illegal or legal. And again, it really all comes down to how wh what the outcome was. So if I gave you um, let's say you weren't feeling too well, and I gave you some cannabis. And that whatever cured your glaucoma or whatever gave you relief from it. Well, that was fine. Nobody cares. But let's say uh, Brian gives you 
a, he's also a healer and he gives you cannabis mixed with wine and maybe it's a little too strong and, you know, you start to feel like anxiety over it. Well, he could get in a lot of trouble for that. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? We Mm -hmm. both gave you cannabis. We both did it for your benefit, but in one case it worked and another it didn't. In the case where it worked, nothing's going to happen to the magician. In the case where it doesn't work, well, he might be executed. Well, that's a hell of a turn. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was very precarious in the ancient world. I mean, all everything in the ancient world was pretty precarious. It's a miracle we've we've lasted this long. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I got. I was reading through David Hillman's book, the uh, the Chemical Muse, and yeah. and he painted a really good picture of you know the amount of of basically the amount of shit that's going to kill you. And, oh yeah, and how how we tolerated that and made sense of it. And, uh, you know, we, as I sit with my heater on in the comfort of my house behind my windows, different, different, it, we can so easily project current day reality onto back then because we think that they thought like we think, but they didn't. Yeah, that's a we in history, we call that an anachronism, yeah. which is when you throw up or you maybe you know this, you're, you're, listeners will know this, but in case some of you don't, it's just an anachronism is when you throw a modern idea onto the past. It means chronologically out of order. Uh, Some anachronisms are really easy to spot. Like if I were to say right now that on his way to deliver the Gettysburg Address, Abraham Lincoln stopped at McDonald's, well, you would know right away that I'm full of shit. Like that, right. there's no way that took place. But with uh, other aspects of history, anachronisms are not so readily apparent. So you have to get in there and really roll your sleeves up and dig and find out what was well, going on. Yeah, let's 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 take that invitation for a second. And how do how does one how does a historian protect? against the tendency to do that because psychologically that's just a fact we just do that we we project our own it's egocentrism we project our own perspective all the time but in sciences and research over time there are various ways that we have built in certain protections against these kind of natural human tendencies so would you speak about that what you've learned about maybe not only the process but also maybe a couple of deeper examples about where you tend to see people do that with regard to psychedelics or witches. Sure. So we, so history, believe it or not, because it's not taught this way in high school, but history is a science. It's a soft science, but it's a science nonetheless. And we use many of the same tools that a private investigator or a detective would use in that you don't want to predetermine anything. Um, or like any scientific methodology, it starts with a hypothesis and you test that hypothesis against the evidence and you confirm or deny it based on what's there. Now with history, it's not obviously an exact science. It's not like, you know, chemistry or something like that because we can't recreate the past. Like going back to, I use that analogy of um, uh, Abraham Lincoln, you know, on his way to the Gettysburg. I can't put that in a test tube and be like, oh, look, here, here's Lincoln. There he goes. Like, you know, he did stop off at McDonald's. Holy shit. You know, I can't do that. So with history, we're always, always dealing with probabilities. We don't talk about what happened in the past. We talk about what most likely happened in the past and what most likely didn't happen in the past. And so there are different criteria. So um, especially in New Testament studies, which, which I also mm-hmm. do, we have what's called the criterion of dissimilarity, which is when you get two different sources that are telling the same story, but they're a little different. Believe it or not, there's actually more a chance that that actually happened because they, nobody gets the story completely right, but we're talking about the core of the story. There, there's probably something there. Mm-hmm. That's just one of many other. There's the criterion of embarrassment. Would somebody have written this down? Again, going back to New Testament studies, presuming there wasn't a historical figure of Jesus. Well, Mm -hmm. he was most likely, he was probably crucified because his followers wouldn't want to say that. The whole idea was he was supposed to have this 
triumphant victory over the pagan oppressors, but instead, you know, he was killed like a common criminal or a terrorist, actually. So you wouldn't really write that down unless it happened. So that's a criterion of embarrassment. Then there's there's all kinds of other ones. Um, you want sources that go as close as you possibly can to the time and place that the the narrative they're talking about happened, for example. Um, so I'm not like if I'm talking about the ancient world, I want to know what ancient authors thought about something, not what somebody from, you know, the 15, 16, 1700s thought about it, yeah. because I'm not going to get as close to what was happening there. Um, so those are just some of the things that we do as historians. Um, we uh, you also you're constantly trying to prove yourself wrong. Um, and any time something seems too convenient, you're probably wrong about it. Like if it works out just exactly the way you were hoping it would, then you probably, you know, drop the ball somewhere in your analysis. So uh, as far as you'd mentioned, um, like things that happen today with that, yeah. I'll give you um, one of, I, I for me, it's it's one of the, the larger ones. So uh, you read Brian's book, and uh, there are things that I agree with it, things I disagree uh, mm -hmm. with it, but I disagree from a professional standpoint. Brian is a friend and a colleague, so I, you know, I, the disagreements the two of us have are disagreements among brethren. Yeah, but, you can fight. Yeah. <laughs> to me, I think that's more like sparring than it is like having mess. Yeah. You know, you spar with somebody to get better at what you do, and so you guys like come together and do your thing. It's great. It, Exactly, exactly. But so for me, the whole idea of there being ergot at Eleusis is completely wrong. Uh, <laughs> it's completely, that is, that is a major anachronism. We, so we today want it to be ergot because we love LSD, or I do, but, and so do a lot of other people. Like we love LSD, we love mushrooms, so we want it to be LSD or a mushroom. The truth of the matter is the only actual plant medicine that we have any evidence for Eleusis is opium. That's it. Mm -hmm. But we have an opioid epidemic today in the United States. So oh, we can't say it's opium. That's an anachronism. That's saying, well, opium's kind of, you know, doing some damage to society today. And lots of people are microdosing with LSD. So it must be LSD that was at the rights of Eleusis. <laughs> nope. No evidence for ergot whatsoever at the rights of Eleusis. Definitely not plenty of, but certainly more evidence for opium than for any other substance used. See, this is where I, I go into a struggle because, okay, I hear it. Great. We've got two different narratives. You know, I have to then become an expert and do my own investigation to come up with my own understanding of what really happened. But that sure. takes forever in a day. So part of what I have to do is find who do I trust? Who's the person who I think is doing this kind of work? You know, I keep having to turn my mic up. Sorry. So who, who, who's doing the kind of work that is citing the sources that is coming to, to, that I could like see their process, they can explain it to me. And then I trust, you know, I don't really have much skin in the game over whether there was ergot there or not. Right. I mean, that is for people who are really investigating this elusis. What what skin in the game I have is that there was a two thousand year ritual that involved life and death that did involve some kind of alternate state of consciousness that was kept secret and hidden, and that reality is to me mind blowing. You know, the details are for people who are in that lane. But what do you say to to people out there who are listening to all these stories? And they hear from people who know what they're talking about, who've written a book on it, that disagree. H how do you, how do you help them come to terms with well, who in the hell do I trust in the first place? Um, well, not to do a plug, but uh, <laughs> in my my follow up to the witches' ointment is called psychedelic mystery traditions. Oh, and fantastic! I um I have a whole chapter on Eleusis where I show why opium is the more probable. I mean, we have carvings of Persephone rising from the dead holding opium. Um, we have, uh, there was a Christian author who participated in the rites who wrote that 
there was opium used there. So we have textual evidence and we have archaeological evidence. We don't have any evidence at all for ergot. So there's there's the the approach of saying, okay, I think ergot was used at Eleusis. I'm going to go in and I'm going to make that case. And that's one way to do it. There's another way to do it, which is how I do it, where I say, you know what? I have no idea. I'm just going to go in with a blank slate and see what happens. When I started investigating Eleusis, I didn't think for one second it would be opium. I that That came as a surprise to me, which was made it seem more plausible for me. Again, I would have loved for it, for it to have been ergot or a mushroom, but I would feel like I am I didn't do my job as a historian mm-hmm. if I were to tell people that. Whereas, you know, that it's opium, people kind of see that as a downer. Well, now you know you're doing real history because people don't like what you have to say. <laughs> that's right. You're fucking it all up, man. Well, then, by the way, that's, yeah. that is a place where I am... I'm currently in. I mean, since Brian's book, I, I have felt a little bit like, and I told Carl Ruck this when I interviewed him uh, a couple weeks back. I said, look, uh, do you ever feel like the guy who's ruining Christmas for people? He was like, yeah, totally. You know, like when you're walking into these stories and saying, uh, not quite that, yet an entire culture has been built up around these ideas, which is pretty shattering you know that can be really difficult to encounter so i've been encountering a lot of people who are having these claims whether it's about uh jesus or uh, early christianity or you know the roman catholic church what was happening there um it it really is a this this idea this this concept of the ways in which we project our current realities onto a history unknowingly I, I think that's one of those like critical thinking thresholds anybody has to go through that starts to look at this stuff. Oh, yeah, that's the train. That's what, as historians, we go through that kind of training, you know, to do that. So what do you what mistakes? I mean, other than the well, before I go there, I'll out myself here, which is that I I'm part of that community that probably romanticizes magic and magi and. I would say something that you've already talked about that you were writing about that, well, there were these power structures that were really kind of pushing up against women and these um, medicinal practices that power authority needed to keep in its own institution. And so it had to vilify or somehow demonize them that was out there doing whatever they were doing that wouldn't be, that wouldn't adhere to the the structure of the institution, whatever institution was in power. How is that tracking? Today? Yeah, like how, like how's the- my theory there about what was going on with witches and magi and magic? Well, so there's some truth to it, but there's also, like, especially when it comes to witches and magicians, it wasn't just the church that like feared these people. Most witch allegations started with a woman accusing another woman of witchcraft, the majority of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when we have like this idea that like the, um, you know, that church authorities were just n- kicking down people's doors and dragging them out in chains. Yeah, that happened here and there, but that wasn't the majority of the time. The majority of the time was somebody accused another person of what the same way, you know, you might accuse me of stealing your wallet. You know, that was how it was done. There's not, we, I don't fear the police kicking down my door. I'm like, did you steal John Price's wallet? You know, if it would, that would only, you know, I would only be dealing with them if you, you know, leveled an allegation against me. Right. Now, there is something to be said where you are correct um, as far as with um, uh, the area of goddess worship, which is what uh, the witch's ointment is, I tried to get at with that, was um, that ultimately the church authorities were far more invested in eradicating this goddess than they were with eradicating these different substances. Um, like as I write in psychedelic mystery traditions, I have three chapters on how Christians used psychedelics. I mean, they did not cover these things up at all. 
the idea that they were covered up, again, is a modern anachronism. We all grew up, I remember being a teenager and having to hide with my friends while smoking a joint and any car that drove by, I'd be like, oh shit, is that a cop, you know? Um, so we grew up <laughs> in that kind of environment. So we invented this idea that, oh, well, you know, authorities must have always gone against these substances, mm -hmm. but that's, that's not true at all. Um, Christian authors, uh, Oregon wrote about it. Uh, Augustine of Hippo wrote about using Mandrake. Thomas of Persain, um, the Trupeter Hohelied, which is a German text. Uh, they all uh, um, Theodoret was a Syrian bishop who would love to ingest opium and read from the Gospels. He loved doing that. That was recreation for him. He didn't cover that up. Magicians didn't cover up their use. Um, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa von Nettesheim, who was a, a Renaissance magician, he wrote um, the three books of occult philosophy and talks about inhaling opium and henbane to see spirits appear in the air. He actually calls them spirits herbs. Now, three books of occult philosophy was one of the most widely read texts of magical texts of the early 1500s. That's not a cover up. I mean, magic was taught in universities. It, 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 it certainly earned the ire of church authorities, but you know, there, there, there was definitely that, um, that tension there. But I mean, Paracelsus, another you know, famous alchemist magician of the early 1500s, he taught at universities. And in fact, he opened up his classes to everybody. So you would have um, you know, village wise women, cunning men, poor people, all coming into his university lectures. There was no, you know, this idea of, of there being cover-ups of substances is a completely modern invention that does not exist in the, uh, certainly not the uh, early modern or Renaissance periods, but why, or medieval why, times for that matter. Why is it that so many folks in the Christian tradition are, are defended against looking at the psychedelics and Eucharists and religious... I mean, I received an email recently... They don't know history. A... <laughs> okay. They don't know their history, that's all. No, that, like, that's, I mean, it, that might sound like a dick answer, but they don't know what they're talking about. That's all it is. I mean, I, I, we, I again, we live in an age of, like, Christian... What's that? I don't think it's a dick answer at all. I think it's exciting. Oh, Okay. I, I'm a guinea from New York, so I sometimes, you know, I, I have to tone it down a little bit. No, Some people are not used no. to it, especially now I live in Portland, Oregon, and people are definitely not used to me out here at all. So. No, man. They're not used to me. So. Let them fly. Let it, yeah, let them fly. Uh, so, no, um, you, you're, you, oh. you were just citing a lot of sources, which is what I wanted to check in on. I mean, you, you, all those sources, I would encourage anybody listening who's saying, what the hell? Go there, you know. That that's what frustrates me is that a lot of people have feelings and opinions, but they don't actually go to the source, which is the researcher's job. I I guess I wish everybody researched a little more. Yeah, well, you can't get outraged if you go to the source, and it's more important these days to be outraged by something than it is to learn anything. So, uh, Tom, God, we're going My all over the place, humor. but I still want to hit this. You're yeah, sorry. You. How do you deal with the interpretation problem? So uh, this is maybe, uh, yeah, let, we'll come back here for a second, but this is my own, like, I, I got to know this. One of the associations that I have with a lot of these texts, is, certainly with alchemical texts and early religious texts, is because of the confusion around being persecuted or having different beliefs, or, or even like working with matter and material, which you couldn't really do as an alchemist, there were ways that people would hide and conceal what they were writing about. How do you, as a historian, deal with trying to get into the mind of what somebody was actually writing and what ways they were possibly concealing what they really meant? I mean, you have to know an enormous amount of culture, language, uh, the perspective of the person writing. What do you say to that? Well, first, I'd start off uh, by saying that it's obviously just like today, it's impossible to get into somebody's mind. I mean, it's impossible for us. We're, we're alive at the same time. 
we're around the same age. We probably, you know, have similar, well, we definitely have similar interests. We speak right. the same language <laughs> and yet neither one of us can get inside each other's mind. Now take that problem and try to do that to somebody <laughs> living five, six, seven, eight hundred years ago. And you're, so I don't, I don't try to get into their mind. The, the thing is, especially with like concealing, a, like a, a meaning that you get with alchemy, you, you mentioned alchemy and that certainly happened, but with other things like, um, like what wise women were doing, uh, there wasn't much of a concealing going on, uh, what Renaissance magicians were doing. Um, again, I mean, they did write grimoires and they did talk about this stuff. So I th the idea, again, that there was this, not to say blanket concealing, but this, you know, widespread need to conceal things in the past. Again, I don't like when I read the texts, I don't see that except for alchemy, because, right. you know, uh, immortality and turning lead into gold are very profitable. So in that sense, you have, you know, people concealing what they were doing. But um, and in uh, let's see, in one case with uh Oh, was it the alchemical text of Ripley um, where he talks about, I think he's talking about a mushroom, but again, it's impossible to tell. He talks right. about a toad that was red drunk off wine that you turn into a medicine that could either kill you or help you. And I'm like, Oh, that could be a concealed reference to a mushroom, but ultimately I don't know. Uh -huh. I have no idea. Man, I had no idea we were going to get so far into this. Uh, you're, you're, I'm kind of going off book here because I'm so fascinated by interpretation. My um, oh sure. My my dissertation. I was looking at four different interpretive modes that Dante was talking about in a letter that I found to Congrande la Scala, who was like the nobleman in in that area, and he was talking about how you can interpret the Divine Comedy from. Uh, or Dante's Inferno from several different lenses, and he named the allegorical, the tropological, and the historic, and the symbolic. And and I took that and ran with it, and I, I I started to apply it certainly psychologically. This is what Jung and Freud were doing. They were really looking at the kind of different modes of being that are expressed in different ways, and they can have conflict with each other. But when you broaden that out into history, and you say, holy shit, I don't know if somebody was literally but was, was speaking yeah. about a literal truth or they were being symbolic? Did they have the capacity to be symbolic in that way? I mean, I project all over these folks in antiquity and I'm, I'm feeling an opportunity to talk to you about this because I think you're going to help me unlock something. Sure. Well, um, I would say that, so here's where textual criticism would come into play. Like again, with the witch's ointment, you do get that. Whereas... There were efforts by some church authorities to conceal that the ointments that these women were using that were causing their, their, their these, these mind altering, mind manifesting effects. You have some cases where these church authorities were trying to cover that up. They were trying to say, oh, no, they aren't substances. There's not drugs in those ointments. There's, you know, the flesh of boiled children or, you know, the, you know, baby blood in there. So you, you certainly have that um, in some cases. But again, you also have other writers, um, uh, uh, Johann Nitter, Alonzo Tostado, at least at the beginning, um, Nikolai Remy, um, uh, among some others. Uh, who else? Uh, yeah, I can't think of any right now. But there were others who were more than, you know, more than open about writing that, oh, no, it's like, She's just, she's very clearly on something right now. You know, mm -hmm. this woman that you think it's the devil. You think that ointment is made out of baby's flesh or whatnot. It's like, come on, look, I mean, you, you can, you can see the herbs mixed into this ointment. Like these are, look, this is henbane. That's what henbane does, you know? So again, you get that mix. There was never this blanket, um, you know, this, this universal paradigm about any of this stuff. So you had some people definitely trying to conceal it. Because if it's, oh, if it's all the use of these substances, these plants, these psychoactive plants, well, that doesn't leave any room for the devil at all. And they wanted to say it was the devil. That was the church authorities did anyway, that were causing these experiences, the, these mind manifesting, we might say entheogenic experiences. Mm -hmm. So, but there were plenty of others saying, no, look, it's, it's, there's substances in there, there's plant matter. When did you, uh, when does the devil come online? When, when, do, when does that happen? 
So the devil is brought into uh, like in in what respect? Like as far as like where do we get the idea of the devil from, or like with witches or with magic? Like all like because there's a lot. There. Oh, yeah, all, all of that. It. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, um, the devil in uh, my estimations actually grew out of um, the Gnostic or some Gnostic, I don't really like that word because there are so many different forms of Gnosticism, but as a blanket term to mean Christian mysticism, uh, there was a being named Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth was the creator of the material world. Most Gnostic philosophies believe that there was the immaterial, pure spiritual world, and there was Yaldabaoth who created the, all that we see, flesh, glass, cannabis, pipes, lighters, <laughs> like all that stuff. That is all the creation of Yaldabaoth. Now, Yaldabaoth come, is um, cognate with the Hebraic name for God, Yahweh, Yahweh Yaldabaoth. So what these Gnostics were doing was saying that the God of the Jews is actually this demonic sort of being mm -hmm. that has trapped us all in material reality. And the only way to achieve gnosis, meaning self-knowledge, is to break free from the material world. Now, as time went on and these various sects that did not win the fights to become what we consider Orthodox Christianity, uh, which again is a little confusing because all of those groups thought that they were Orthodox. Like we only call the winners Orthodox because they won. Right. Yeah. But um, like the Marcionites, that was considered a Gnostic group. Well, if you asked Marcion, he would have said, no, we're Orthodox, dude. Like, what are you kidding? <laughs> so, so the thing is, as time went on, Yaldabaoth became the devil, in a sense. It became the counterpart to God. Uh, and that's, again, that's a long story. I'm not going to get too deep into all that. But just give an idea of where the devil originated. That's more or less where our modern idea of the devil originated. Would, wouldn't there were it, always demons. Oh, go on. What's sorry. That? Oh, no. There were always demons and malevolent spirits like out there. Absolutely. I mean, the ancient Hebrews had a vast demonology. Um, but as far as there being this, you know, ruler of all evil, Satan, that grew out of uh, Yaldabaoth, and then over time came to be the counterpart to the Christian God. So, so two questions there: Isn't doesn't that correlate with Christ when when God incarnated in human form? Isn't that really a a point where the devil, as we know it, came more online? Is that safe to say? Um, so are you referring to theologically when God incarnated into Christ? Because I see, I see it all historically. I don't see it as awesome. a theology at all. No, I so, get it. Like, um, I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm talking about more, um, psychologically, like when people started writing about this and thinking about this and seeing, seeing reality in this way that God incarnated in human form, that's the kind of Christ antichrist dynamic but you don't see that historically. Well, so historically, I mean, also the idea that God incarnated into Christ is a later um, adaptation of Christianity. The first Christians did not believe that about you. The first Christians believed that Jesus um, was, was just this herald, so to speak, this prophet that was going to bring about the coming kingdom. Um, and in those days, the kingdom or heaven, as we call it today, was not a spiritual place. It was a physical place that was literally going to come down on earth and crash down on top of the Roman Empire. Mm. So the earliest Christians like Jesus, I believe it's only in the Gospel of John, which is the latest gospel. But Jesus in Mark, Matthew and Luke never refers to him uh, himself as the son of God. Or I think there's one or two, but um New Testament scholars know that these are later interpolations, like they were added to the text, but there doesn't seem to be any indication that the actual historical figure of Jesus, like the guy, thought that he was the, uh, the, the son of God in any way. Um, as far as the, what you're talking about, the incarnation of Jesus and having this counterpart, the original counterpart 
to Jesus wasn't the devil, it was Adam. The, uh, hmm. the term for this in Latin was the radix apostatica, meaning the root of all apostasy. And the idea, especially if you read Paul and the, the early gospels like Mark, the idea of Jesus is that he's supposed to overturn Adam's transgression against God in the garden. That was his original kind of mission, at least according to the earliest writers, which would be Paul, about who Jesus was. Oh, that opens up a lot of the... I, I'm going to say right now, Tom, I, I, you know, in maybe three months, we got to book another conversation because I want to talk to you about your newest book. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, um, yeah, you're, you're kind of a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the, the cr- Christian f- form. I, I, I'm totally interested in what you're talking But let me go back really quickly because sure. I got off on the devil. And one of the things you said... Oh, don't that, we all? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've written a number of songs from that position. So, demons. You said demons were everywhere. What were de- what what was a demon like? What how, what was the cosmology? Illness, illness mm-hmm. uh, somebody causing or you to do something wrong. You know, if you you stole something, oh, it was a demon that told you to do it. You know. Well, this has to. There, there's almost a deterministic piece here like the fates like uh, oh yeah I'm kind of i'm acting out of something and and here we see a collision between free will and the fates so it in the i'll, I'll say cosmology and the world view of the people that we're talking about and i know we're that, that that sentence fails but what we're talking about is that there are these events that happen in an individual's life that seem to be beyond human comprehension and so those are positioned in to be these uh, demons or gods. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and yeah. so when an illness came, they didn't have the formulation that said this is a germ or a virus or or some kind of, you know, gut issue. What has happened is you've done something wrong in your life and you then you have to atone for it in some way or you just suffer the consequences. Yeah, which is why I think it's in the Gospel of Luke. Um some of the earliest versions of um with the story of jesus healing the leper Mm -hmm. it actually it doesn't it today in in your bible it'll say jesus felt compassion and healed the man in some of the earliest sources for the story it says jesus got angry and healed the man well why did he get angry he got angry because there was he saw it as well this demon or like caused this leprosy and you did something you haven't lived a good life, and that's why you're a leper today. I'm going to heal you anyway, but, you know, straighten up and fly right, leper. Man, wow. So, yeah, it's actually the only place in the whole New Testament where it's recorded that Jesus got pissed off. Oh, and didn't then there's he, Didn't the... he get pissed, like, throwing the tables over in the temple? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was just about to say, I'm like, wait a minute. No, he also gets <laughs> pissed off, but he overturns the tables. And he get Well, I see, I don't think that story happened. Um, but he does also get pissed off at a fig tree at one point. I don't think that the the overturning of the tables happened because he would have been arrested right there on the spot. Uh-huh. You wouldn't. You don't just walk into the temple, start overthrowing tables, like okay, peace, I'm out. You know, like mic drop and walk off. Right. You'd be arrested right there on the spot. So I don't think that story ever happened personally. It it is an act of what I'm learning is that there are times where I interpret things symbolically that need to be interpreted literally, and things that I interpret things literally that need to be interpreted symbolically. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that shit is driving me crazy. I think becoming interested in kind of this academic pursuit has been by far one of the more humbling, other than being a husband and a parent. Uh, has been one of the more humbling acts of my life, just because every time I learn something new, I, uh, two things happen. I am all of a sudden exposed to the amount of scholarship on that subject that seems completely wide and dense. And also, I have to realize how wrong I was about the assumptions that I had back there. And that's that's a that takes a degree of... Um, I think it takes a degree of humility because you have to be almost excited about being wrong. Oh, yeah. 
And that the people don't like that very much. No, but that's where discovery is. Yeah. That's the thing. Like when you realize you're wrong about something, you finally understand it. Yeah. You get it now, which is awesome. I, I, I like it. Well, at the risk of going too far afield, what got you into all this in the first place? Uh, when I was 18 years old, I ate mushrooms for the first time. And I was like, I want to know everything about this. <laughs> like, what is this? You know, um, what happened was I had a really amazing and profound experience. And I came back and I just felt really stupid. Like, I felt like I didn't have enough intelligence to understand or appreciate what had just happened. Um, so I actually, I wasn't in school at the time. I think it was like two weeks, a week or two later, I signed up for the spring semester at Nassau Community College. And uh, so when people say, oh, you know, drugs, they rot your mind. Well, in my case, mushrooms made me go back to school and then get my undergraduate degree and then get a master's degree. That was all yeah. because of mushrooms. Cause I was tired of like, I wanted to keep eating mushrooms because I love them, <laughs> but I didn't want to keep feeling like such an idiot. Every time I came back from that experience, I wanted to have some kind of, I guess, universal um, paradigm to fit it in. And um, I'm not smart enough to do any of the hard sciences. Like I would have loved to have been able to write a book of like, you know, mathematically how, you know, eating, you know, eight, 10, whatever grams of mushrooms, like how here's the formula for how your soul is actually connecting with the cosmos. But I, you know, I can't do that. So I, I always had a thing for um, just uh, for like, let's see, how could I put this? Just f solving puzzles, but mm -hmm. not like, you know, like a jigsaw puzzle. I liked being able to figure things out. Um, when I was a kid, uh, my mom would read to us, my, my twin brother and I, before we go to bed. And uh, one of the, the series of books was called uh, The Adventures of Sherlock Bones and Scotson. And it was about these two dogs that would go and try to solve crimes. And the whole thing was that, you know, they would give you all the clues and you had to try to guess, you know, who done it, you know, before you flip to the last page. Um, I got it wrong every single time. I never once figured out, you know, like who really took, you know, the cat litter or whatever, but, uh, I still, I loved the process and I enjoyed trying to figure it out. Um, and so I just mixed my love of psychedelics with my love of trying to solve, you know, puzzles and solve like the, the whodunit, but I couldn't eat mushrooms and become a cop and become a detective eventually. So I was like, well, what's another person that solves puzzles? Oh, a historian. So I'll do that. What do you love about mushrooms? Wow, what's not to love about them? The connection, um, the, I call it the perfect chemistry because like, uh, I don't know if you or any of your listeners have ever done Molly or ecstasy or anything like that, which is awesome, but it's, it's so neurotoxic. Whereas mushrooms, the that ecstatic feeling is far superior to Molly in, in my opinion. And it, um, it's natural. It doesn't, it's not doing any neurological damage. If anything, it's strengthening your neurological pathways. Uh, remyelinization is what it's called mm -hmm. where the myelin over your nerve cells actually rebuilds, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, and yeah, I just love that. The, the uh, the connection. I'm also like, I am a, if you, this is behind me, that is my altar to Gaia. Uh, I am a goddess worshiper. So when I eat mushrooms, I do it uh, to connect to what I think is the creator of the universe. Uh, what a Christian would call God, a Muslim would call Allah. I call Gaia. I think that the creative energy of the universe is actually a female energy. Mm -hmm. It does seem or that way, as, doesn't it? I, I saw a bumper sticker not too long ago, which I liked. It said, uh, my goddess gave birth to your God. <laughs> and uh, I, I, that, that really resonated with me. I like that one. That makes sense. What, uh, what do you have to say about that? Um, that shift from a goddess to a God. Why, why do you think that happened? So... Um, I go over this in actually the chapter on um, 
on Eleusis in my book, Psychedelic Mystery Traditions. I think what it has to do with was the recognition of the male's part in the birth process. Um, so this is a little meta here, but stay with me. We're going to have some fun. Good. I think that there was actually a time when people did not know that the sexual act led to childbirth mm -hmm. because you'd have sex and it wouldn't be till weeks, a month or so later that you have the first signs of pregnancy. So to, you know, how did an ancient person interpret that? So this is getting back to that, that whole idea of anachronism and, you know, the work of a historian. Oops, oh, oh, sorry. I just kicked something open. Um, the, I accidentally hit the, uh, the ejector on my uh, computer, the, the tower, and it just started pushing the seat yeah. into my foot. I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> but um, so I think that there was a time when people didn't know that babies actually came from sexual union and that the rites of Eleusis, the, the earliest forms of it, predated that knowledge. Before Eleusis, I think that there was a, a very primitive form of this rite that centered around birth of the child mm -hmm. and as time went on and i don't know how this happened but it was discovered that oh men actually do have a role in the so if we just stop having sex with you that could be the end of life as we know it plus due to evolution we are we have bigger body types so we could just beat the shit out of you if you don't do what we say mm -hmm. i feel like that was a big changeover of power that information was too powerful to be wielded at that time and i think that those early humans abused it they abused that now in the same way people abuse the internet today i think that it's that this technology is a little too powerful for humanity as much as i love the internet it's a little too powerful for humanity did you find, have you found any, because um, uh, I know it's out there, anthropologists and archaeologists certainly can look at that. Do, did, have you found evidence to look at the kind of goddess worship? It, it did, in your experience, does wor worship of the goddess predate worship of the god? That's tough. Um, there were so, so the other thing is, when we talk, when I talk about the goddess today, like Gaia, I'm talking about a concept that did not exist in this ancient, the, the time that we're talking about in the deep ancient past. Uh -huh. People had local goddesses and local gods and things like that. They didn't, there wasn't this over encompassing being, you know, and we know that because the first religions were all polytheistic. There were many gods, many goddesses. Um, so it's like, unfortunately, how that process, how that that um, that giving up of the goddess in favor of the god, I mean, that is that's probably going to remain lost until we invent time travel. Mm -hmm. Like we don't really know. But again, I have my speculations about it, and everything I said, um, you know, I just want to be clear is speculation. I don't, I don't know for certain. Sure. Well, it makes sense intuitively. That's that's one of the things. I mean, childbirth is pretty miraculous, and yeah, exactly. And I mean, the whole the 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 the, the community like it needed that in order to survive, right? You know, and maybe as we we uh, we got more civilized and we lost more of our body fur because we used to be covered in hair, we started to notice. Oh, wait a minute that kid kind of looks like the last dude that boinked Susan mm -hmm. because Susan. people were named Susan back in the, no, I'm kidding. But you see what I'm saying? Like, you know, the child does take on the physical attributes of both the mother and the father. So at some point it's like, well, wait a minute. Why does that kid look like this guy? Mm -hmm. like, what is that? So maybe that's how they started to come across that idea that the male had some kind of role in the birth of the child. Okay, thank or you. Not birth, but you know, creation. I should say of the child. So you've mentioned it a couple of times, polytheism. Mm -hmm. What have you learned through your your research about when polytheism moved over to monotheism, and what what's your idea of what was happening and how it affected the uh, you know healing, health, wellness, medicine, witches, so on and so forth? Sure. 
Um, well, there was a bridge between polytheism and monotheism called henotheism, or henotheism as it's sometimes called as well. Um, I'm sure you could pronounce it either way. I think it's the tomato tomato thing. But uh, what uh, henotheism is, is the belief in many gods, but the idea that there was only one for you. So as a, a very famous example, um, the ancient Israelites. The ancient Israelites believed in all the gods that the pagan of the pagan pantheon, of the polytheism. They just believed that, oh, those gods are for those people. Yahweh, we only have one God for us. Mm -hmm. So, and there's, I mean, there's definitely talk that there was a, a goddess in early Judaism. Um, I don't know much about that, though. Uh, that's that's a little, I'm, I'm not the expert on ancient Judaism. So I also want to, you know, I know a little bit about it, but not not too much. But um, there does seem to have been like Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, whines and bitches, complains about people still worshiping this goddess in um, Judea, so in Jerusalem. So certain ancient Israelites were absolutely worshiping this, this female goddess. Um, and he's just one example of, of people complaining about this. So um, I don't, uh, I think it might have had something to do with the the female goddess coming from their oppressors like you know the egyptians had goddesses but they also had gods so again it's so uh it's so frustrating because we don't know yeah i mean i guess my it seems like when i was reading witch's ointment you have a lot of a lot of what you're looking at is 13th 14th 15th century sure. and so what we have, though, again, start going back, way back in our conversation to our timeline. So uh, before Common Era, Common Era, then we've got, let's say, you know, zero to three or four hundred A.D. or B.C.E. What was going on in the religious life then? Uh, can you speak about that? In the before the Common Era or the Common Era? Common Era. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, common era. With which peoples? With the what was happening in Western religious traditions that were moving into the Roman Catholic tradition that would kind of bring us up to date okay. through the... So a lot of syncretism uh, seemed to have been happening, at least in uh, polytheistic uh, circles. And some would argue, like Richard Carrier and Robert Price would argue that it was happening in Judaism as well. Um, I personally think that they take it a bridge too far with that. A lot of the stories that they say were influenced, like like the, these polytheistic stories and how they influenced Judaism, and Christianity, things like that. I think they're surface level at best. And I'm not saying I'm not a I'm a goddess worshiper. I'm not a Christian. I'm saying that as a historian, I don't think that a lot of it stacks up as far as syncretism is concerned. Syncretism. Right. Do we define that? Sure. Syncretism is the idea of just taking idea. We would call it cultural appropriation today. Right. Just taking ideas from different areas. Um, so one idea is uh, that Richard Carrier points out, so I should probably just qualify this real quick. Um, he talks about the goddess Inanna mm -hmm. and how the Jesus story is somewhat based on the death and rebirth of the goddess Inanna. And I mean, as I read the, the tale of Inanna's descent into the underworld, she doesn't actually die and enter the underworld. She actually walks through, I think it's seven gates through the underworld and meets her sister, Erikigala, uh, who um, determines that Inanna must be killed by this, you know, high council of the underworld. And they take Inanna and they hang her on a hook. And then two spirit beings that uh, a friend of her, was it? I think it was Enki or Enlil sends down to um, revive Inanna. And so she comes back three days later because of the three days. Someone says, Oh, look, see Jesus rose after three days. They're just like, yeah, but what about the whole rest of the story? Jesus didn't walk into the underworld, pass through seven gates to meet his sister named Eric Kigalan and be tried by a high council in the underworld. Like none of that lines up. So I think that there's, with syncretism, and I, I just want to get that, you know, qualify that before we move on, I think that a lot of times you have that certainly in, in polytheism, and we know that because the Greeks just readapted, excuse me, the Romans, the Romans just renamed Greek gods 
you know, for their own benefit, like Hades became Pluto as just one example right. of, you know, endless examples. So you have that form of syncretism. Um, then in, if we're talking about the first century of the common era, of course, you have the rise of Christianity, which again, um, I know that in Brian's book, he tries to make Jesus this kind of Dionysian figure, but I, I don't see any of that when I actually look at, like the points of comparison Brian uses don't actually exist in the ancient world. So again, I don't think that they're like, Jesus does not strike me as a Dionysian figure at all. Um, yeah. Why? So, okay. Um, and again, uh, I just want to say real quick, uh, this is a critique of a friend of mine's work. I do not hate Brian. Just so uh, if anyone's like, Oh, Tom Hatzis is talking shit about Brian Morescu. It's like, no, I'm not. <laughs> this is a disagreement among brethren. So I just want to make sure I get that out there. I happen to have a totally. lot of affection for Brian. I think he's a great guy, really smart. And I thought the immortality key was a great book and is a great book and everybody should read it. Um, however, as far as the points that he uses to, um, bring, I'm getting so off the question you asked me. I'm so sorry. Is that go, okay? down, go where you're going? I like this. Okay. Um, Brian pretty much uses three points of comparison for, uh, Dionysus and Jesus. First, he says that Dionysus was born of the virgin Semele. Semele was the human mother of Dionysus. Zeus was the God, you know, the mm -hmm heavenly father now if we want to say that there brian would be correct that you have an idea of a god you know betting with a mortal right sure there's totally that there however semele was not a virgin i don't know where brian got that idea but he writes in the immortality key calls her the virgin semele there is no ancient source anywhere that refers to her as a virgin mm -hmm. nothing on top of which, Dionysus was not actually born of Semele. Dionysus is known as the twice-born Dionysus because Semele is actually killed by one of Zeus's lightning bolts, and Zeus grabs the womb, that's Dionysus, and sews it into his thigh. And then Dionysus is actually born out of Zeus, which is the word Dionysus means twice-born Zeus. Dio to Zeus, Dionysus. Um... So there's that, where there's no comparison. The second area uh, where uh, Brian makes a comparison, I believe he says that God turns into a dove, dove, excuse me, in order to fuck Mary. And this is much like Zeus turning into a swan in order to fuck Semele. Now, Zeus turning into a swan to fuck Semele absolutely does happen. However, there is no place in the entire Bible, New Testament or Old Testament, where God transforms into an animal and comes to earth. In mm -hmm. fact, there's only one instance of God actually coming to earth, and that's in the Garden of Eden, where after Eve and Adam eat the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God is, it's said that God is walking around the garden looking for them. I think what happened was Brian conflated the opening of the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptist. Uh, the skies open up, a dove comes down. And a voice shouts from heaven saying, mm -hmm. you are my son, today I have begotten you. I think Brian conflated that story of the dove coming from heaven with the idea of God turning into a dove to have sex with Mary. But again, that doesn't happen. The third area is that Brian says that um, just like Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding of Cana, he says uh, several occasions in, in his book that that was Dionysus's signature miracle. Dionysus never did that once. There is literally no story in the ancient world of Dionysus waving his hand over water and turning it into wine. Never happens. There's a story of Dionysus getting married on the island of Naxos, where as the ceremony is taking place, it says that the rivers and streams started to flow with wine. Okay, maybe you could argue that point, but that's not Dionysus actually performing that miracle. It seems to have been a byproduct of his, you know, just this wedding ceremony and a natural or supernatural byproduct. The other area where Brian correctly points out, and we were actually just emailing about this two days ago, um, where the uh, Posianus records that some priests of Dionysus 
would put three pails of water in the temple of Dionysus overnight, and they would turn into wine. Now, this story actually comes a hundred years after the life of Jesus. So if anything, it could have been borrowing from Jesus, not the other way around. And second, even if it's not borrowing from Jesus, this is still not an example of Dionysus performing this thing that Brian says was his signature miracle. But when you, never, put, when, you, when you push up against him on this, what does he say? I've never brought that to his attention because, um, you know, I'm not trying to come down on the dude. I like him a lot. I'm not, you know, and right now he's dealing. Somebody wrote a really mean spirited uh, review of his book. Uh, which uh, accuses Brian of distorting history, uh, which is not what he's doing at all. And I don't, while I agree with the reviewer in some aspects, is, you know, the more critical aspects of the immortality key, when he gets into the personal attacks, I just, I can't follow him there. And, uh, you know, knowing Brian as much as I know about him, and I consider him a friend, he's not trying to distort history. He has his interpretation of, you know, the evidence as he sees it. But, you know, he's not a historian. He's a lawyer. So he's going to, you know, he's going to miss some things. And again, I'm not knocking him. I'm just saying that, like, if my engine blows, I'm not a mechanic. I'm taking it to a mechanic to fix because I'm not trained to actually solve that problem. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. Well, it, it, what's great about that is that it's, it's easy to, to go into. I mean, if I'm going to write a, my philosophy on this is if I'm going to write a book and I'm going to plant a flag and I'm going to do my research, I'm going to understand that my ego may be challenged. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, that, and that's hard. That's hard. That's tough, right? If I, if I have established anything, then what I need to do is have an attitude that says, no, I'm totally willing to say, hey, dude, that was like a year ago. That was like... Six months, that was 10 years ago, and my thoughts and feelings and everything, I've changed, I've grown. In fact, I'll critique my book. Oh, like, yeah. I can tell you, I wrote a dissertation three or four years ago, and I would write a totally different dissertation right now, and I, I don't, I, it's not something that I would write today and say, this is good, I want to turn it in. It's sure. something that, in fact, I would say, no, man, I, like, I've spent four years of learning all this stuff, and I would very much write a different dissertation now. Yeah. Uh, and and with okay. that said, you know, you would be able to say something like there's not a single source and he'd go, yeah, there is. Here it is. And you'd go, oh, shit, I didn't know that. Or he'd go, oh, sh damn it. I missed that. Like, great. I hung my hat on that thing. And now I need like to me, it doesn't need to be one of those kind of ideological messes. It can do, simply oh. be a here it is. Yeah. I um so in my follow up psychedelic mystery traditions, uh, the follow up to the witch's ointment, one of the chapters I talk about everything I got wrong in the witch's ointment. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I say, look, this is I I was totally like uh, there was somebody who critiqued it and pointed out um, you know, an area that I, I completely got wrong, and I wasn't like ah oh, well you know fuck you. It's when it's like oh shit, this dude's right. I totally drop the ball on that one you what know was it so um i write about uh an account uh and i had my reasons for for dating it at a certain time um that deals with uh the sacred book of abramoline the mage which mm -hmm. was written in the early 1600s the latest um, translation of that book uh by a guy named george den who is a german occultist dates it to the early 1400s and now with history and doing it you stand you know the standard practice is you go you always go with whatever the latest scholarship says mm -hmm. and so for the the reason this guy dated it and for the reasons that i thought he was correct i also dated this text to the early 1400s it is absolutely not from the early 1400s it's from the early 1600s so i was off by two centuries but i could admit that, that. like i got that wrong and so I, that's one of the things that I correct in psychedelic mystery traditions that, yo, I dropped the ball on this one. I'm so sorry. Like I did the best I could with these manuscripts. You know, there's, there's really, there hasn't been anything much written about the witch's ointment. Um, so, so much of it, as you know, cause you read it is all based on primary sources. I dug up from archives because that's all there was. So I, I definitely got that wrong. Um, 
I also, cannabis was used a little bit more than I gave credit to it. Mm-hmm. I would say that as well. Uh, a colleague of mine, Chris Bennett and uh, Brian as well, a colleague of ours, um, he had pointed out to me a few areas where it's like, no, look, cannabis is here. So I have that chapter, Roots of Bewitchment, where I talk about opium, henbane, ergot, uh, mandrake, belladonna, de toro. Good chapter. Thank you. Um, and I, there's no mention of cannabis in there. Like, mm-hmm. I think I, there's one recipe where I mentioned cannabis. And as it turns out, there is enough, there's enough there that I could have done, you know, a sub chapter on it. Um, there's enough there. I yeah. just, I missed it. You had a couple of references, but yeah, I, that's, but that, to me, that needs to be our attitude that, that hopefully we're creating a community of people that are able to go, look, I'm doing my best here. I, yeah. I've, I've sourced everything. You can find where I, I, I'm labeling it. I'm showing you and I'm going to mess up and hopefully I write something else and critique myself. I, I just don't, I think the attitude really needs to be one of discovery and exploration. And the problem is, is when we double down on any theory and we become really ideological and unable to, which I think this is my critique of a lot of religions, like institutionalized religion, is that there is such a, an enmeshment in the tradition that they can't see anything that may refute that tradition. They can't pivot. Sure. Yeah. I mean, chaos magicians kind of work that way too sometimes. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But uh, yeah, there's humility as well that we have to approach these questions. Again, history is all probability. So there's not like if you're worried if you're wrong about something, well, yeah, you probably are. So don't worry about it. Like do your best, but you're probably wrong because we don't know. Well, and that's I guess that's one of my curiosities, I should say. I mean, in the past five, six weeks, I have interviewed people who have said things such as, uh, you know, there there was a literal Christ, and that Christ was literally born by a woman who literally conceived, and parthenogenesis is a very real and literal occurrence. Then somebody else says, Christ is a myth, no such thing existed, it's an archetype that we will continue to see in every different tradition that'll manifest in different ways. Then somebody else says there were sexual um, cults that existed, and in fact, the human body was an apothecary of sorts that um, uh, fluids from the body could be used as antidotes for various venoms or oh, yeah. substances that were given to the individual. And in fact, Christ was involved in these and would take the semen from uh, another human, and that was the antidote, and that was communion. Then communion was a mushroom. Ergot was at Eleusis. Opium was at... It's a lot, right? There's a lot of different ideas. What, do you, what, do you, what comes up for you when I say all that uh, just then? Well, just that it all has to be taken on a case-by-case basis. Um... You have to look like, uh, so take Jesus then. Placing him, there's nothing wrong with placing somebody, a historical figure in their historical and cultural time and place. So Jesus is referred to as a rabbi over 40 times in the New Testament. So he probably was a rabbi of sorts. I mean, they call him teacher, but that's what they mean. They mean rabbi. Well, as a rabbi, he probably would have known about something like cannabis because cannabosm, which is the Hebrew word for cannabis, appears in um, the Song of Songs and is also mm-hmm. in the Holy Anointing Oil. So if Jesus were a healer and a teacher living in the first century of the common era, he probably did use things like cannabis to heal people, like the real, the actual guy himself. He probably, we can infer that. Now, do I know that for a fact? No, there's absolutely no direct evidence that Jesus was smoking a joint. I'm just saying if you place him in his cultural time and place, you can get to him using cannabis in the same way that you can't get to him using, let's say, I don't know, ergot. Mm -hmm. You know, because there isn't much there as far as uh, the uh, Hebraic tradition. There is mandrake is there in the Hebraic tradition. 
So you could get Jesus using Mandrake. Again, it doesn't say anywhere that he was, but you can with inference get there. It's not an outlandish thing. So that brings us to psychedelics, and I'm aware of our time, so I want to be conscious. And I want to get into psychedelics, because earlier you referenced the, I think one of your core interests is looking at um, entheogens and religion. Yes. And, and so would you dip a little into that and give us the history of entheogens and religion? Sure. Um, so let me start off by saying that I'm not one of those people that believes that religion was spurred on, on by entheogenic use. Like the Wassonian, uh, Robert Gordon Wasson, his whole thing is that mm -hmm. all religion came from specifically mushroom use. I don't think that at all. I think that the religious impulse existed before we knew about using these kinds of plants, fungi, whatever. Um, what I think they did was sort of confirm religious ideologies in the very distant ancient world. Um, it allowed people, they allowed people to step outside themselves and actually feel something from within them that wasn't like an illness. Like most things are felt on your outside, right? right. You don't feel to, unless you have like a stomach ache or you got to take a shit or something like that, you know, but you know what those things are. Eating a psychedelic mushroom and having to take a shit are two completely different feelings, mm -hmm. completely different experiences. So I think that there is something to be said about entheogens reinforcing the religious impulse, but I don't think they actually kicked off the religious impulse. Um, I don't know if you want me to keep going. Yeah, keep like going. Yeah. No, no, no. I don't think so at all. I think because the question's really general and uh, essentially I'm trying to see, it's like a catch-all, you know, trying to see where you go with a really broad question like that. And sure. And look at, you know, okay, so you've answered something important, which is that there are theories out there that say that religion is created by created by having an experience like this. But I'm with you. I mean, we can have religious experience in all kinds of ways. Yeah, exactly. I mean, contemplating the sky is like a, a radical way of, of being. So I don't, I'm with you. I don't need to... Um, I can go into, and also that whole entire thing that Peter Kingsley writes a lot about, with the, which is incubating. You know, like in the Tibetan tradition, a friend of mine is a, a part of the Tibetan tradition, and when I told him I was really interested in incubating, he said, "Yeah, the Tibetans do that. I mean, there's and there's no entheogens. You go sit in a cave, totally in the dark, for days, and you fast, and you are, you know, in this kind of mythic realm, and." I would imagine you've got some pretty crazy visionary experience when you oh, yeah. do just that. So I'm totally with you. So, but speak about this because we're we seem to be talking about religion, healing. So so medicine. Mm -hmm. um, so religion, as far as theology is concerned, like talking about the gods, um, medicine. So healing are the human. And, and having a kind of spiritual experience or my, or my relationship to the god or the goddess. Uh, again, but go through the psychedelic process. Sure. Okay. So then you have, I believe it all started with medicine. And actually, uh, Pliny uh, writes in his natural history that, it, you know, all magic begins with medicine. Yeah. So what I think happened was people were taking these kinds of medicines, opium, cannabis, mandrake, things like that. And having the, what we would call visionary, you know, aspects of it, you know, there was, which were certainly recognized in the ancient world. I mean, ancient writers talk about them. And what happened was, it's like, so you're, the, these, we're talking about a time when everything was caused by something else. Correlations always had a causation or uh -huh. causation, I'd say, always had a correlation. So this plant, let's just say opium, because it was one of the most widely used plants in the ancient world around the ancient Mediterranean. I mean, you find opium everywhere um, as far as in, um, you know, residues and carvings and stuff. So now opium has a very clear, noticeable effect on a person. Now, these people, these are people that, OK, well, there's there's energies and gods and goddesses in the rivers. There's a god of that tree. There's a goddess of that grass. There's 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 some kind of natural godly or goddess force behind everything. Well, what are you going to think when 
you take something like opium or cannabis and you have this really mind manifesting experience. Oh, well, I'm taking the God inside me, just like we know people did with Dionysus. I mean, the word entheogen is from the ancient Greek word enthusiasmos, which is having this religious ecstasy. So you're taking this God inside of you and it's like, oh, okay, well, this worked. I, this is something sacred. We should build a temple to this thing. You know, and that probably just started as a small shack or a shed or something. People would come in, they would take something like opium, and they would call out to this goddess, uh, especially in Greek, there was a poppy god, in the uh, Minoan, I should say, uh, early, you know, the pre-Greek times, the Minoan opium goddess. You know, we, we have statues of her. So uh, we know that people were worshiping an opium goddess in the ancient Mycenaean culture, uh, excuse me, Minoan cultures, not Mycenaean, Minoan cultures, Minoan. Uh, too many M's, sorry. Um, and um, so that's where actually I think Persephone and Demeter and the rites of Eleusis, and that's another thing where I think Brian gets it wrong. There seems to be a clear line of evidence from the Minoan poppy goddess. Yeah, Minoan, not my son, Minoan poppy goddess, becoming the uh, Demeter, the uh, goddess of grain and opium and things like that. Um, at least we have a carving of Persephone rising from the dead where she's holding wheat, snakes, and opium poppies. So again, that's that's pretty hardcore evidence. We don't have any association with ergot just to drive that point home again. But so it starts off with medicine. People start taking these medicines in recognition that there's some kind of force, some kind of spiritual goddess or god force behind it. They start building these temples in which to have the right setting for this medicine taking. And then before you know it, it's like, well, I'm not exactly sick, but I really liked how that medicine made me feel anyway. Again, the euphoric effects of opium or of mm -hmm. cannabis. Mm -hmm. And so they just start taking it. If that, you know, is uh, sufficient. Well, it, yeah. It, it, um, so you're getting into the differences between the sacred and the profane. So where you've got like sure. the re religious based versus the recreational based. And uh, of course, when the worldview isn't one that understands what a virus is, if a medicine heals me, then I'm, I mean, that's connected with, with God, you know, with some kind of faded um, uh, other who's got, got my back. Sure. And also, I just wanted to say real quick, uh, you had separated just there the spiritual use from the recreational use. Because again, we do that today. In the ancient world, like the, the Dionysian ritual, Dionysian rituals, excuse me, were, I mean, they were debaucherous affairs. I mean, there you talk about recreation. I mean, it's a bunch of people drinking infused wines and having orgies. Right. That sounds like a great fucking time to me. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> That, but that, you know, that could kind of count as recreation, but it was spiritual at the same time. It was still the worship of this God, but in this recreational context, or we would call it recreational. Yeah, it, it's, not not okay. it's, it's not okay to do when you want to do it, but as long as you're honoring a God, go for it. You know, yeah, exactly. uh, bl bliss your ass well, off there. Well, you will, because in one sense there's consent and in another there isn't. I mean, if everybody's showing up for this Dionysian ritual, they know exactly what they're coming together to do. There's that consent. So it's, you know, there's a difference there. What, uh, another broad question, Tom. When, so here you are, and I, the reason I got here is because I, I recently asked somebody, uh, which which translation of the Bible that I should read? And he said, well, none of them, because they were all written by Christian people, like uh, sympathizers, you know? You need somebody who's outside of the tradition to be able to write about the tradition, and I get that in theory. I mean, I've got a new Oxford annotated Bible It's a, uh, with Apocrypha, it's the NRSV, it's it's a it's a great Bible, but you have the shrine behind you of Gaia that you worship Gaia. You have these kind of uh, religious processes. You are a historian. What is Christianity like? Critique Christianity, like sure. what happened there? Okay. Um, well, so 
I'm not, uh, uh, let me say that as I'm, I'm, obviously I'm not Christian, but I'm not anti-Christian yeah. at all. I don't have a problem with anybody having whatever beliefs they want, as long as they're not hurting anybody or themselves. And the, actually, you know, if you want to hurt yourself with your belief, that's your own prerogative. Just don't hurt anybody else. Um, so that's something that strikes people as a little odd about me because most you know people that hold my kinds of witchy polytheistic beliefs are usually anti-Christian, but I'm not. I think, look, it's a difficult life. Anything that helps get you through it. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as critiquing it, originally Christianity was just an apocalyptic religion that was trying to overthrow the pagan government, the oppressors, right? So in the same sense today, like we had, um, where it was in the South, uh, on the, in the Southeast and like Georgia, North and South Carolina, you had people pulling down statues of Confederate soldiers, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Which makes sense because that's gotta be, I, I wouldn't want to see a statue of my fucking oppressor in a town square, right? Right. Well, what do you think the Christians were doing when they were tearing down all those pagan temples? The same thing. These are the people that have been oppressing them for centuries. So when they finally came to power, their first thought was, yeah, I don't want to look at these statues of our oppressors, tear them the fuck down, you know, get rid of them. So one of the things I often say is like, well, if you're okay with the statue removals in, you know, the South East of the United States today, you shouldn't be mad at Christians for doing essentially the same thing 2000 years ago. So, I don't, you know, I don't fault that where I do fault them was their, uh, their unrelenting knowledge. That's my kitty cat just came in that they were correct. Mm -hmm. That's the part that kind of bothers. I think bothers a lot of people, but most Christians today, at least the ones I know, they don't, they don't think like that. Like they're like, yeah, you know, like they don't care. Like they don't care about homosexuality. They, you know, they, they don't care about, oh, you're fornicating. Of course, you have the, those psychopaths with the West, what is it? West the Westboro Baptist. Baptist. Yeah. And you're, look, you're always going to have absolute shitheads like that. They're going to exist. But most Christians, I mean, most of like, they're just nice people that give to charities, help elderly people cross the street with groceries and try to live a good life. Now, the part that I think is funny is that that's not who Jesus was, and that's not really what his message was about. When he talks about, you know, loving your neighbor, being good, he's only talking about Jewish people in his immediate surroundings. I mean, his thoughts of the, you know, of the pagan rulers, you know, was every bit the way we would look at, you know, slave owners from the 17 and 1800s, which is like, you know, like, go fuck yourself at, like, that's Mm -hmm. horrible. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that today Christianity gets some things right. Um, but it's, I don't know, it's a mixed bag. Like, oh, really? I mean, you know, it's like, and we also have to separate that like Jesus, he saw himself as a Jewish person. He had never heard of Christianity. Right. You know, (laughs) like he never heard of that. So, it's like we have to separate those two things, the Jesus, the guy, and Christianity, the religion that he had never heard of. That was more or less, in my opinion, invented by Paul. Um, so I think that he's, Paul is every bit as important, if not more so, than Jesus, because Jesus wasn't even trying to start a religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, sorry, I, I keep going so off the of your questions. I'm apologize. No, I, uh, getting I back to I my thoughts on Christianity. Um, yeah, it's a mixed bag. Uh, it definitely was not a good time to be a Christian. If you were a poor person or a woman or a poor woman living in medieval or early modern times, that definitely sucked. Definitely don't want to be part of that, uh, community. But again, today, I mean, most Christians are pretty chill people. And I, I don't have a problem with them. And of course you get the crazies. Um, and I, I've certainly been called a variety of names by, uh, you know, let's say over enthusiastic Christians. Every now and then I'll get emails calling me a fornicator and a sinner and blah, blah, blah. And all these Bible verses about how I'm going to hell. Like, <laughs> you know, I still get those as well, but you know, the majority, I, I, I just take those as lone nut cases and I don't, I don't demonize the entire religion based on the opinions of, people that I think are kind of stupid personally. 
Yeah, that is interesting. What would motivate somebody to write that email? So I have a video because I have a YouTube page and one of my videos was, um, I think Jesus and uh, plant medicines is the title. Hmm. And so that really pissed somebody off. Um, what else? I was called a heretic and apostate for that. And uh, every now and then I'll get those kinds of emails and like, oh, I worship the devil and sacrifice children and shit like that. You know, I'm glad you said that as twisted as that is, but what is going on with the baby blood drinking thing that so that actually stems from an ancient pagan stereotype dealing with uh insurrection the earliest references we have to drinking blood uh like the drinking the blood of the innocent comes from pagans talking about other pagans who are trying to take over you know or seize power in, in some way so then later on, when the Christians in the first century, and they had pagans, you know, ridiculing them, uh, there was a guy, he writes about how pagans would um, um, say that Christians drank blood because they believed that Christians were trying to take over the, the pagan Rome, which they were. I mean, and eventually they did succeed. Right. So that was part of that old stereotype. And so what happened was once, and this is often what happens when an oppressed group receives the keys to the car doors of power, once the Christians were on top, well, they turned around and said, oh, those heretics, they're the ones drinking blood. And then when witches, you know, they, they, in the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, they said, oh, women are doing that too. They're using children's blood to, uh, you know, mix those ointments that cause them to have those, you know, far out experiences. So it was just this way, this ancient way of accusing somebody of insurrection was to say that they drank the blood of people. Wow, it's just activated today. What's that? It's activated today. What do you mean? That narrative that there are people out there who are involved in child sex trafficking and they're drinking the blood of children. Oh, really? People yeah. talk, still talking about that? Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's all the uh, the QAnon stuff is in uh, is involved in that. Oh, I don't pay attention to Which that. is fascinating, considering that uh, one of the folks I was interviewing was talking about how, how fascinating these repetition motifs are, where we seem to see the same kind of patterns that exist. And so current day, we're seeing insurrection and you know, the kind of political upheaval that's, that's going on. And of course, the, the civil rights issues and gender equality, you know, all these narratives that were very prominent back then as well, and similar conflicts and, um, and acts of imagination that are used to either um, demonize the other or uplift the self or the group that I'm in. Absolutely. And so what I would say with like the QAnon people, they're just, they don't even realize that they're just carrying on an ancient bullshit stereotype. Right. Which but is they're fucking certainly fascinating. Out. Like, yeah, I mean, Yes, that is. And let me just say that I'm not denying that there's sex trafficking, which is awful. I'm sure it happens. Totally. I'm saying that I don't think any of these people are drinking anyone's blood. Again, because I get emails of people accusing me and of that. And I assure you, I've never drunk any child or anyone's blood for that matter. Well, and that's uh, I'm I'm starting to read documents from the Inquisition and that's really fucked up stuff that see i read those documents and i'm i'm thinking about who's writing this that oh, yeah. is imagining that they cuz i don't know that they were doing what they were saying they were doing and in fact i would imagine that they're not but what's happening is they're trying to assert some agenda to villainize somebody else to you know uplift their own cause yeah, that's what you were talking about that cover up earlier. Again, like these women were absolutely not drinking the blood of children. They were not mixing the blood of children into their ointments. That's just, they were mixing plant medicines into their ointments. But that's what the church said. Well, some church authorities said, oh, they're, they're just carrying on that stereotype. Uh, I go over that in, uh, I think it's chapter three in the witch's ointment, the heretic's yeah. potion. I, I talk about how that whole thing unfolded. Yeah, it was great. I I just I I, I should have um, I should have read your other book too, but that does actually give me an opportunity to read that soon. Okay, so with time approaching, I want to be sure that I read my notes. I feel so bad. I feel like we did not talk about any of the things you actually wanted to talk about. No, that's that's what's beautiful about this. I I, I have a, a a mind of spontaneity. It's a okay. path of discovery, man. I mean, this is like. 
we just set the container and uh, and meander. I mean, this is great. I'm learning well, a shit ton. Yeah, we're Neanderthals. I mean, we are Neanderthals. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, even after you said that, Tom, as I'm looking at my notes, which are like little bullet points of things I want to get to, we did get to all the things I wanted to get to. Yeah. Um, See, I knew I, I could do it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, Satan, what is Satan and the devil is one of the first things, and that's what we got into earlier. My uh, must. Okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, actually, you, you spent a good amount of time tending to this in one of your chapters in The Witch's Ointment, you, you, and I'd love just to hear you say a little bit about it now, sure. science and witchcraft. Like, could you riff on that for a bit? Sure. Um, I believe it'll be just a little second. <laughs> Say hi, Chris Emmy. Say hi. No, don't catch me. Come on. Sorry. Come on. She's, no, just, she's no, not getting attention, so. No hello for others. You get all the love. Yeah. Say hi. Say hi, I'm a little kitty cat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, um, now she'll leave us alone because I've paid you attention. Got love. For sure. Five seconds. Um, so, yeah, I was talking mostly just about how. Um, you know, modern scientists have actually uh, experimented with witches' appointments and had similar kinds of experiences. Uh, like there was a German toxicologist named Gustav Schenk, who, who um, he inhaled henbane, which was one of the uh, plants found traditionally or commonly in uh, what we call flying ointments today or witching ointments. I tend to call them transvection ointments because that was closer to what was going on. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, his account reads remarkably like, you know, th th these, this sort of, you know, uh, imagery of flying through the air with all these different animals and these formless creatures. And um, there's also uh, a report by uh, the 16th century physician, uh, Andre uh, Laguna, who uh, writes about this lady who um, was an insomniac. And he got his hands on one of these flying ointments and decided to try it on her to see what would happen. So it was kind of as an experiment. And um, she came back and she was talking about how she was at this, you know, this large dance, this big party. And she was upset that they woke her up because she was actually cheating on her husband in this strange land in her mind. And so I was just talking about the difference of how uh, these women might have... Um, interpreted these plants and this experience with later scientific efforts to demonstrate that these kinds of ointments do lead to these kinds of wild fantasy-like experiences. Okay, so million dollar question. What does all the, another really lobbed ball I'm going to throw out there. What does all your um, your investigation and your research and your religious life what what have you learned, or how do you understand reality, the nature of reality? What do you think psychedelics show us about the nature of reality? Wow. Um, in 10 minutes yeah. or what? No, okay. 10 minutes. <laughs> no, even worse. It's like five minutes. You got five. Okay. In five <laughs> minutes or less. Um, so I would say that the more dig into my own research and the more I eat mushrooms and the more I am going to be working with ayahuasca as well. I mean, I have, but I'm going to be working with it more. The less I actually know about anything. Mm -hmm. I get more and more unsure every single day that I have any handle on anything. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I don't like the idea of when people say like my truth, I, I don't have a truth. There's the truth, and then there's all the shit that I just don't understand. I do, however, have things that serve me. And so what I would say is, like, if, when I talk about my own spirituality as a guy, as a mushroom-eating guy worshiper, I wouldn't say that that's my truth. I would say that that serves me. Um, I draw a lot of inspiration and just personal healing and power from my spiritual practices, I hope that I use that energy to create good in the world. Um, uh, but I ultimately get more and more confused the more and more I research, especially history. I, I don't, I'm, I'm just doing my best 
to try to figure it out all the while realizing that I really ultimately at the end of the day, I can't say anything for certain. I mean, I could tell you what's there. I could tell you what the texts say. I could tell you what the evidence points towards, but I could be totally wrong about that. Ultimately, I don't know. Why do you continue to search? So much fun. (laughs) (laughs) It's a lot of fun. And I mean, we've got to do something with our time. And I'm not a big television watcher. So uh, mushrooms instead. Uh, The show is way better. It's the greatest show on earth. It sure is. Well, what are we leaving out? We've got a few minutes. Sure. Um, So, yeah. I... uh, I don't know. I mean, I just spent an hour trying to say all or two hours saying all this stuff only to wrap it up by saying, ah, I'm not totally sure about anything again, because we're talking about probabilities. Um, I can, I can trust. Am that, I, Tom. What's that? I can trust that. Okay, cool. Um, you know, there, there are certain things where we have a good idea about like, were women demonized as witches and burned at the stake? Yeah, that, that, that happened. Um, but I would so like to just be able to talk to one of them Mm -hmm. or just one person that went to the, you know, the rights of Eleusis or one person that was part of the cult of Mithra. Like I would just like to speak to one person. Like when people talk about like, Oh, if you could talk about anybody, you know, talk to anybody from history who just wanted it does to talk to anybody from history would be fascinating. It doesn't have to be George Washington or Julius Caesar. I want to speak to a peasant woman who is using these entheogenic ointments and ask, yo, what the fuck is like, what's your experience like? <laughs> like, I have my interpretations of it. I wrote a whole book about it, what I think it was. I want to know from you, though, what, like, what do you get out of this, you know? So that, you know, just to speak to anybody from the past would be amazing. Uh, where do you want to direct people? So a few places, actually. Um, I do have a YouTube channel, which I actually started. I post weekly now. I was very lazy with it for some time. I would only post like once every few months, but um, I now post every week. Uh, that's uh, The YouTube is Psychedelic Historian. Uh, I also have an Instagram, which is Psychedelic Historian. And um, my partner and I are trying to build the world's lo- largest digital repository of psychedelic literature. Uh, we call it the Sanctum Psychedelic Library because I have this whole box because I've been studying psychedelia for 20 years. So I have this box of hundreds of papers. And um, if they were, would go to sanctum.org, that's P-S-A-N-C-T-U-M dot org, uh, you could check out where the library is at. Uh, it's not totally finished, but when we are done with it, it will be, I'm pretty sure, the largest... Um, digital library of psychedelic history on the internet that's exciting congratulations what a massive endeavor yeah um yeah it is it's huge um so yeah we read all the articles we post them we write synopsis of of, we'll write a synopsis of them let you know where it's coming from who the authors were and uh yeah there'll be a you know a um uh, uh a scanned copy of all the articles if they want to check that out um and on that, uh, we are a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization. We're a psychedelics harm reduction education group. Um, we do happily accept donations um, if people want to support our work and of building the library. Um, I have a Patreon as well, but I don't really push it at all. Um, I think I have like I make like two dollars a month <laughs> off of it. <laughs> so I think there's like two people there. That's it. But uh, if you were to go to patreon.com slash psychedelic witch, um, not psychedelic historian, psychedelic witch, uh, that's where my Patreon is. And um, if you to see more videos and support my work, uh, if not, you know, that's cool, too. Well, I will have plenty of resources listed and I'm uh... I'm feeling so grateful for this time, Tom. This has been expansive and very pleasant. It's good to get to know you. So thank you. Yeah, likewise, John. Likewise. Thanks, man. Hang out for a minute. Let uh, Let me shut this all down. Much appreciated, man.